Hi, I'm Joel Bloom, president of New Jersey Institute of Technology. At NGIT, we believe that not only our students, but all citizens need to be informed about the issues facing higher education. As New Jersey Science and Technology University, NGIT is proud to support the important programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by NJIT, New Jersey Institute of Technology, Wells Fargo, Kessler Foundation, Changing the Lives of People with Disabilities, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, Johnson & Johnson, Adler Aphasia Center, helping stroke and brain injury survivors recover their speech, and by Verizon. This is one on one. I'm an equal American just like you are. The jobs of tomorrow are not the jobs of yesterday. Look at this. You got this? Here it is, man. Look at that. Life without dance is boring. <laughs> I don't care how good you are or how good you think you are, there is always something to learn. Do you enjoy talking politics? No. People call me because they feel nobody's paying attention. Our culture, I don't think, has ever been tested the way it's being tested right now. That's a good question. High five. Hi, I'm Steve Adubato. This is One on One, and this gentleman you're about to see on camera uh, is a very talented young man doing all kinds of things on Broadway. Tony Carlin, veteran of Broadway, professional understudy. By the way, how many plays are we talking? I, uh, this is my 27th play that we just opened, 27th Broadway play. And the uh, name of it is? St. Joan with Condola Rashad uh, by George Bernard Shaw at uh, Manhattan Theater Has Club. he done much? <laughs> George <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I worry about him. He really? doesn't work enough. That's yeah, part of the problem. Yeah. By the way, the, the whole understudy thing, as I was getting ready for the show, I'm like, okay, so Tony understudies. He's an understudy for one actor, one role. Not the case. If only. Um, in this play, I understudy three actors who themselves uh, play six characters. So uh, I'm a dead soldier. What are you right there? What, what, what am I? Right there over that, that monitor. <laughs> that is my ensemble. Uh, the, I am a French soldier. Uh, well, the janitor French soldier. That's backstage. Uh, oh, I just want to make sure bucket. that's not part of the set. <laughs> <laughs> so that's just a piece of... All so I don't understand. I seriously, I actually don't. I'm doing one show, one role. This is me. You've got six. You have three actors, six roles. Yeah. How do you have that in your head? Right. Well, I have a head like that, <laughs> uh, a compartmentalization. Um, I have to be in the play six different ways in my head. I have to prepare that I am in that play. The thing is, and, you know, I, I, there was a great thing in the news that may explain the feeling of going on as an understudy, and it was the Chicago Blackhawks mm. had their Why are you going third to string. Here? Well, they had their Go third ahead, string ahead. emergency goalie go on as an understudy he's an, an accountant a guy named uh, i think it's uh, what do you mean he was Scott. an accountant <laughs> he was an accountant that they got down to their third string and he went on for a game and he made like 27 saves because he had to because he had to that's the thing and is that your mindset yes i may have to yeah. do, do you do you always know when you are going to have to go on no no uh, i have had a week to prepare sometimes, but I'm kind of the one who doesn't get the call until like half an hour, 20 minutes before. And they say? And they say, you're on. And um, that's the thing is people say, don't you just get nervous? Was, and yeah. there is not enough time to get nervous because I'm wearing the costume for the first time. The costumers are messing with my costume for the first time. Uh, if there's a mic, the sound people are doing the mic. So there is no time. Where's your head? My head is in the play and going over each of the lines. I have a particular way of preparing to be able to be in the play without rehearsal. Like an actor, uh, a show is prepared mm. from rehearsal hall and we get to have fake props and, and spend four weeks I don't have that time, so I have to create that in my head. So I make a recording of the play by myself, 
doing the other pe people's lines so that when I'm home, wherever I am, I can do the play and so that those lines will come out regardless of where I am mm. or who I'm talking so to. So let's try this. Give me an example of who you were an understudy for and I'll show you where I'm going with this. Name someone. Uh, Alec Baldwin. Okay. Oh, that guy? Um, talk about talent. Where is he now? Uh, just, Where is his too, career? Two bad yeah. things haven't worked out. So you're an understudy for, in? In uh, a play called Entertaining Mr. Sloan. Got it. So Alec Baldwin is there doing Entertaining Mr. Sloan. You're the understudy. You have to go on. Is the play different because you are playing that role as opposed to Mr. Baldwin? It is. I would like to think that uh, the audience is excited to, to see uh, a new actor uh, saying the role, but the, the fact is that people go to see Alec Baldwin. And Are you aware so, of that? I'm not aware of it. Um, I would like to not be aware of it. No, there no, was... there are two different things. You would like not to be, but are you? I'm not really aware of it, unless there's a huge groan uh, when I am announced instead of Alec Baldwin, uh, which there wasn't when we went on, so I'm, I'm golden. Uh, but uh, it was funny that Alec Baldwin is a big guy. Possibly we are the same height. No, he's but heavier he's than you. Big he's big and guy. beefy. He was telling me how to do a physical thing, and I was just like, oh, oh, okay, <laughs> yeah. Uh, not emotion behind it. He's just a big guy. And Does that so, help? What? Or do you say I have my I have a certain body type. You have yours. You, oh, you, um, it, it's great to go to the horse's mouth for a physical piece of business. Mm. Um, to know where he might have worked out how to put his hands, uh, how to you know do all of that little stuff. The in the play, I remember watching it over and over again and watching him. Mm. And in the play, he sort of um, he tries to get next to this kind of pretty boy. In it's in England in the '60s, pretty boy who's played by a model. I forget his his name. And he was standing there next to him and really lording it over him. And when I got there, under the lights, with the audience, I realized I was nowhere near lording it over. That this model that I was standing next to, that he towered over, I was the little guy. And so it does change things. Where I thought, oh, I have to play it slightly different. Because and changes the play. It changes the play a little, yes, a little. yeah. But the other thing, I'm fascinated, before I let you out of here, your family, mom, dad, yeah. in the business, yeah. you said five siblings, five all siblings. one time or another, acting. Yeah, yeah. Because? I guess it's in the blood. Um, not because my parents made it look pretty, uh, but we at what certain- I'm sorry, what I'm looking, I'm sorry for interrupting. What oh. is that? That was is a that couple outward of, bound. That is outward bound. Georgia, what's the year? 1940, 50, uh, 1954. Is that that's not? That is my father, and my mother. That's Francis Sternhagen and Tom Carlin. Oh, that that's them right there. Yeah, playing together. Yes, and that's her a little older, with me at an opening night uh, of a play that I was in. What was it like for you growing up in that family? Uh, it was, it was great. I'd rather ask your dad, but go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Your late dad, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Um, the thing that was great is, I, with that picture of my dad, um, he was an Irish storyteller, and, uh, I remember, you know, breakfast time, where he would be talking about the moment in a play that makes it. Really watchable. And I thought, oh wow, this is breakfast. This, you know, where he, you could see the tears in his eyes. I think, oh, right, okay, this is, they understand what I do. That's beautiful. You know, and I understood what they did. I gotta tell you something. Um, I've interviewed a fair number of people over the last several couple decades. You have just, I've never heard anyone with a story like yours. I've never really understood um, what someone who is an understudy 
does, and you just helped a lot of people understand just a little bit more about uh, an extraordinary art form. And I want to thank you for joining us. Thanks, Steve. Well done. Stay right there. This is on one-on-one -on -one with simply fascinating people. We'll be right back after this. To watch more one-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato, find us online and follow us on social media. We're pleased to welcome Mr. Bill Ryan, President and CEO of the Transplant Games of America, and Elise Glennon, Vice President, New Jersey Sharing Network, and full disclosure, a new member of the Board of Trustees at the Caucus Educational Corporation. Uh, this is a big deal. July 2020, the Donate Life Transplant Games. Bill, what is it? Why does it matter? Well, you know, the games have been around since 1990. They're intended to raise awareness for organized tissue donation and make people aware that there's 115,000 people still waiting for an organ in the United States. Wow, and in New Jersey, that number, Elise, is? We are just about 4,000 people currently mm -hmm. waiting for a life-saving transplant. And people who watch our program on a regular basis know that we've been collaborating with the Sharing Network for several years now to increase awareness around organ and tissue donation. The connection between the Sharing Network and the Transplant Games is? Well, we're, we're thrilled to bring a national program here to New Jersey. It's going to be in New Jersey. It's finally going to be in New Jersey. We're really excited. Big deal. Yes, I think our entire community is just thrilled. Um, transplant recipients, patients waiting, donor families, our hospital partners, the transplant centers, the entire donation and transplant community mm -hmm. is thrilled to bring this type of program right here to New Jersey. And you know, we feel it's gonna raise the level of awareness of organ and tissue donation. It will help increase the donor registry. It will certainly get this conversation started around mm. the dinner table. Uh, it's a very important conversation for people to have and, and we're thrilled to be hosting. Bill, what goes on in the games? Uh, there's a lot. There's six days of uh, 21 sports competitions. Let's do the dates, by the way. I'm sorry for interrupting. We're talking about July 17th to July 22nd. Go ahead. 2020. There'll be 21 sporting events and probably 58 to 65 programmed events ranging from opening ceremonies, closing ceremonies, donor tributes, uh, workshops, seminars. It's, it's a host of activities for 10 to 12,000 people, and it's going to be a big deal. Why New Jersey? Uh, a lot of competition, as I remember. There is a lot of competition, but, you know, the, the, the team put together a great presentation. They won the bid based on the fact that there is a lot going on here in the East Coast, and there's a lot of work to do in the, in the donation transplant community here. You know, the opportunity to make a difference in this lease, we've talked about this on air and off air, all the people who are waiting, what's life like for them? It's hard. Um, you know, uh, games like these, opportunities to bring the community together provide hope. And I feel like that's one of the most important things because when you are waiting for a transplant, um, you don't know what the future holds for you. Uncertainty. And if we could provide, we as the sharing network, uh, we as the transplant games could provide a little bit of hope for those people on the waiting list where they see life after transplant. Mm. They'll see thousands of transplant recipients who had that hard, long wait. They'll see them with their beautiful and very productive lives after transplant. Uh, and I think that's, that's something we really can, can do for those patients here in New Jersey and across the country. It's a national, clear national event. You're seeing the information uh, for both the Transplant Games and the Sharing Network on the screen. Go on the website to find out more. But let me ask you this. From a national perspective, I mean, we've been involved in public awareness in New Jersey and in the region. How aware are most folks about the, the folks who are waiting, 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 and the difference that we can make. Because in New Jersey, you have a license, I'm actually renewing my license as we speak uh, today, and there's a check off. Tell everyone real quick, you check off, I'm you can, in. You can check off on your driver's license or register online on the national registry. Is it yes. the same thing across the nation, Bill? Yeah, it's pretty much. I mean, every state manages their own local database. And, and some states do it better than others. Uh, but the national database is meant to be a, a supplement to the statewide programs, and, and they're all doing a better job. You know, we're slightly over half the adult population in the United States are on the donor registries. Half? Half. We need, we need more. You know, we need more to, to address the, the needs of the community. So 
Uh, New Jersey's pretty got some pretty good numbers. You know, uh, there are some states that don't have very good numbers at all. Mm -hmm. So, you know, our message is national in scope. We have 44 teams from around the country, you know, that participate. I mentioned 115,000 people earlier that are on the list waiting for an organ. But, you know, there's also half a million people undergoing dialysis right now. That, uh, some half of which, a million? Some, some of which could be candidates for, wow. for transplant. How'd you get into this? Uh, I'm a donor dad. I lost two daughters uh, over the course of my life, and you know it's a it's a, an activity that means a lot to me. My do one daughter was a donor, and uh, so I kind of took up the the sword from her to fight it. It's interesting how personal this is for so many people. I, I've disclosed many times on the air that my my wife Jen um, donated her kidney to her brother, and um, so I got to see it close up. You know. It, it is the gift of life. Yes, and, and I'm glad you brought up how personal it is because the other thing you're going to see at the transplant games is that, yes, the recipients are competing for medals, but you know who gives them the medals? The donor families. Wow. So there's really wow. a beautiful connection. A um, you know, we are going to encourage the entire community to come out and watch these games or sure. a portion of it. Um, we're certainly gonna promote it wide and, and far. By the way, I got um, some partners here that are help making it happen. Who are they? Yes, yes. Uh, RWJ Barnabas, Hackensack Meridian Health. Um, the Meadowlands uh, Chamber. The Meadowlands Chamber and Convention right. and Visitors Bureau. American Dream. American Dream, wow. Uh, all part of our bid, all coming together um, to make this happen here. Uh, you know, we, we all intend to make this the biggest games that have ever been before, mm. um, and everybody's fully on board. By the way, there's, a, there's games happening. Salt, is it Salt Lake Salt City? Lake, Salt Lake City, Utah. When? August 2nd through the 7th. Come on out. Okay, that's this, that's this year. year. That's 18. Yep. So it's every two years. Every two years. This is extraordinary. And someone watching right now, you're watching us on a lot of different states, a lot of different platforms, digital, TV, listening on radio, whatever you're seeing us. What can someone do if they say, hey, I want to be a part of those games in Jersey, New Jersey in 2020, July. By the way, we're talking July 17th to the 22nd. They want to be a part of it. Well, I would I'd encourage them to, to get onto the, the website and take a look at it. There's a way to sign up for newsletters and be caught in the news and be updated on, on things that are going on leading up Salt Lake City as well as the games in, uh, in Jersey. Well, if you will have us, we will be there with our crew and a whole bunch of other folks in the media, Excellent. I'm sure, documenting this and, and promoting public awareness. I cannot thank you enough. Appreciate you coming in. My and pleasure. as always, my friend. Thanks for um, having us. Thank you, both of you. Thank you, Steve. It's important stuff. Stay tuned. Be right back right after this. To see more one-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD and follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. We welcome back John Castanis, President and CEO of University Hospital in beautiful Newark, New Jersey. Good to see you, John. Likewise. Nice to be here. Um, I should disclose University has been a longtime uh, underwriter of our programming, particularly on the healthcare side of Caucus Educational Corporation. Um, John, biggest challenge in urban healthcare today is fill in the blank. Maintaining high quality care and trying to do it all within uh, an increasing reduction in uh, resources financial reimbursement from third-party payers. What does it mean, third-party payers? Well, <clears throat> Medicare and Medicaid, which is the government category, uh, any state appropriations, local appropriations. Uh, as we all know, most municipalities, even starting in Washington, <clears throat> everybody's challenged with their budgets. That's right. And uh, with that, it trickles down. And when you have a public acute care hospital, such as University Hospital in Newark, that's owned and operated by the state of New Jersey, along with the state's uh, budgetary challenges, it trickles down to the hospital as well. So it's so interesting. University, it, it's, it's not run by the state. You lead it. You don't work for this. You know, you're not an employee of the state of New Jersey. I, I happen to be, <coughs> as are most, most of our employees. However, to your point... But you have your independence. We have, we have a board of directors right. that are really the ultimate responsibility for uh, running the hospital. It's so interesting. Uh, you've been... In, by way of background, we were just saying before you got in here, a few years in the industry? <laughs> uh, try 38. 
started in hospital administration immediately? Yes. Front, first line, front line administrative position right out of graduate school way back in 1980 at uh, the Manhattan Eye, Ear, and Throat Hospital. Moved on to work mm -hmm. uh, for New Rochelle, what used to be called New Rochelle Medical Center. Right. Then on to um, working with the Sisters of Charity on Staten Island and then the Hospital for Joint Diseases in Manhattan, which ultimately merged with uh, what is now called NYU Langone Medical Center. Sure, bring it back to North. The constituency, the population you serve, describe it. It's uh, <clears throat> what we refer to as a vulnerable population. Vulnerable. But, but, but when you talk about uh, racial or ethnicity, um, half of the city, more than half of the city is African American uh, with many other minorities. Uh, I remember a stat off the top of my head where <clears throat> about 47% of the families that live in, um, in Newark <clears throat> and use our hospital speak a foreign language in the home. Right. What about the whole insurance? Underinsured, insured, what's the situ situation? We, we have um, a large <clears throat> portion of the population that are eligible for Medicaid. And with the Affordable Care Act in play, <clears throat> we became an expansion Medicaid state here in New Jersey, that benefited places like University Hospital because it expanded uh, the eligibility for those that didn't were a little bit above the poverty level, where the poverty level was at 100%, at it's now at 133%. Did it help, John? It helped the a ACA lot. helped? We, the hospital did get to see more Medicaid-insured uh, patients coming to the hospital rather than all those that were presenting without insurance at all. So, so, so interesting, and this is, not, we're, this is not a political show, it's a public policy so, show, so I don't understand this. The repeal the, of the individual mandate, okay, of the ACA, how does it impact the population you serve? That's specific to the insurance exchange plans. <clears throat> okay. they, it, it doesn't pertain to those that are now eligible for Medicaid. To be honest with you, we didn't see anything significant in terms of patients that are opted to buy the discounted insurance exchange plans with subsidizations, which is a whole other controversial issue right now. But we didn't see people who signed up <clears throat> with these insurance exchange plans. Uh, there wasn't a significant sign up in Newark, mm. and as a result, we didn't see anything significant but the Medicaid expansion piece was important to the hospital. The whole question of transparency, there's a lot of discussion around, you get a hospital bill, you, wow, look at that bill, where'd that come from? And there's an effort in the state house as we speak right now to change that whole dynamic so that there's more transparency, explain that. I, I think what you're, pertain, uh, you're <clears throat> referring to, Steve, is uh, the out of network yeah. issue. Does that affect the university? Uh, to an extent, not too much. Again, not we, we see a lot of government uh, reimbursement, Medicare, Medicaid, and government subsidization. But on occasion, because we are the only level one trauma center, for yeah, let's example, talk about that. you have patients that are brought in from outside Newark, outside of Essex County, to our, our yeah, specialty. Explain what that means, the level one trauma center. <laughs> We're the only level one trauma designated center in northern New Jersey, meaning uh, the highest level of injury, uh, the <clears throat> level of uh, specialty care that's needed to help somebody survive uh, and get better is really centered at Newark Hospital. And we have medevac helicopters bringing patients from all over the area, particularly from uh, the northern part of the state, and that runs at a very high cost. Mm -hmm. But uh, with that, you might get patients that are not under Medicare or Medicaid, but their insurance plan is not negotiated with mm -hmm. the hospital. And they'll get a full bill uh, from the hospital if their respective insurance company refuses to pay the bill. So the state has grappled with this, I understand, for the past eight years. Yes. And, and there might be some recent legislation <clears throat> that we think the governor is going to sign off on. Governor Murphy. Correct. Where um, <clears throat> there's going to be an arbitration process where the parties will get together and there will be at least some adequate reimbursement to mm -hmm. the hospital that's not part of the insurance network that the patient uh, has covered. Yeah. Sorry for interrupting, John. The time we have left, I'm curious. <sighs> Fiscal challenges in the state, you being connected to the mm -hmm. state. Do you think most folks understand the challenges that University Hospital faces every day and the importance of those dollars? Uh, in all fairness, probably not. Uh, we have <clears throat> a, a dependence on uh, charity care funding, which the Uncom state- Is that people who come in Correct, people with no insurance Got at it. all. 
and uh, <clears throat> we do get a special appropriations funding every year. But again, that's dependent on the availability of funds that the right. state has. So in those areas, we watch very carefully on how the state budget is evolving. And of course, we do our best to input to the state and our uh, elected officials to understand the importance of that special funding to University Hospital. Because not, not just for the denizens of Newark, but for all of Essex County and the surrounding areas, we have <clears throat> a lot of great uh, surgical specialists, including our liver transplant program, our uh, fairly new vascular wound center. We have a lot of specialists that are needed, uh, not again just for the uh, local um, Newark residents, but also for mm -hmm. those that really need specialty care in addition to the trauma services we provide. John, listen, complex stuff I know, and I know the population you serve every day uh, that, that is vulnerable. You used that word early, early in the conversation. We thank you for joining us and um, enlightening us. We appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you. All the best. Check you out next time. This is One on One. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by NJIT, Wells Fargo, Kessler Foundation, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, Johnson & Johnson, Adler Aphasia Center, and by Verizon. Promotional support provided by Meadowlands Regional Chamber, building essential connections that drive business growth. And by NJ Biz, all business, all New Jersey. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. I think at NJIT there are a lot of smart students. I came to NJIT for mechanical engineering because within state it's one of uh, probably the top three schools for engineering. It sort of creates a friendly competition where you know you can learn from them. It's a great academic school. I feel I'm being challenged, but at the same time, I love the classes I'm taking. The atmosphere of being here is like a, being at an upstart company. It's that same kind of drive, that same kind of passion. 